Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Johnny Alexander and I'm welcoming you to another edition of Novelist Unwind. My guest today is Deb Elkink and I am so excited to have Deb with us because she has written one of the most fabulous books I have read this year and, and I'm just really excited to talk about it. Um, I will tell you that Deb is part of the Mosaic Collection and as some of you may know, I'm also part of the Mosaic Collection. This is an international group of women who are writing contemporary novels. Um, some are romance. Um, I'm not sure what mine's going to be yet. Deb's is definitely in the women's fiction category. So if you just follow the Mosaic Collection, you'll be able to find a variety of novels written by talented Christian women. Can I say that about myself? <laughs> <laughs> Deb, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Johnny. It's just delightful for me to join you. I kind of nerve wracking, hey, with when you're on a, on an interview where you're being audio taped and you're or shown. And I have to say immediately, oh, Johnny, you're absolutely. <laughs> I read. I've only read one of your books so far. Where treasure hides. Oh, it is. It touched me so much. I've recommended it to many. Well, thank women. you. It's absolutely excellent. And it, and and uh, one of one of my favorite books in the last five years that I've read is Doers, All the Light We Cannot See. And oh yes, I've read that. I, oh, it's a lovely book, and it really, really reminds me of your oh, book. Oh well, that's high praise indeed. Thank you so much. Yeah, I love Where Treasure Hides, and it's still probably my. It was my debut novel and probably my favorite of all the novels I've written so far. So. It was your debut novel. Oh, that's yeah, amazing. yeah, it was. It was it's delightful. Yeah. Well, thank you, and thanks for talking about that. That's so sweet. Um, but I want to talk about your book because okay. it is, and I don't say this lightly. It is just absolutely amazing. So I want to show everybody. This is the Red Journal. You can see all the mosaic novels have this little banner across the top, so you can see them. And even though it is a collection, these are standalone books. Some of the authors may have series within the collection, but each book is, is going to be different. You don't have to read them in order or anything like that. Deb, The Red Journal. This is, it, it's a complex book. Um, three main characters, time shifting. So we have like today and then we have like a month ago and three weeks ago and then leading up to the climax of the story. I want to be so careful about not giving things away, <laughs> but the book has so much depth and I'm just in so many layers and I'm just wondering how you did it. <laughs> I mean, how many drafts did you go through? What was the initial spark that led you to tell this story? Well, Johnny, Thank you for that praise. Many reviewers are just saying it's too complicated. I love and it. there is a difference between complication and complexity. Yeah. And um, I know that there's not one book that absolutely everybody likes. But this book was so much fun for me to write. And uh, the spark for this book, the spark for the, for the first, like the story level of the book, uh -huh was a trip to Conrad Mansion in uh, Kalispell, Montana. And this, uh, there are lots of these around uh, our, you know, our two countries, our two nations, whether living museums or uh, uh, mansion museums where the, woman, the guide will take you through a home in period costume and explain to you the history of the person and the lifestyle behind it. And th that's what the Conrad Mansion did, uh, tour did, and uh, uh, the guide, you know, and, and the whole history of the place was that there was a founder who founded the town or who's a co-founder or whatever of Kalispell. He was an influential businessman that brought wealth and brought uh, stability and a spark into th that town. So what I did, I thought, for that first level of story was, yes, this is a good, because it was a mystery in his story, too. Oh, and it was okay. a mystery, a little bit like my uh, founder's mystery, my, the, uh, the mystery behind the, the man that, that is in the backstory of my novel, and also comes out throughout one of the characters. So what, what I did after I had that idea, I said, well, 
I love stories that have layers of meaning. So how am I going to do this? And there is no, I've never used a program like uh, Scrivener or one of those. And I think if I got onto one, it might be a little easier, but no, <laughs> I use, uh, I use a binder with, oh, okay. hand, with handwritten notes <laughs> and one page equals one scene. Oh. And one scene might be uh, two paragraphs, not generally, or five or six pages. And um, each scene, uh, I try to have the scene end with a little mini cliffhanger. We don't, I you know, a little mini cliffhanger. Something that there's another question that's coming. There's another problem. And so when I start to draft just with word, I make use of track changes, and every time there's a little comment, say, oh, yeah, I can do that, I make myself a margin note. Oh, and I just wow. fill it up with margin notes. Oh, there's so many writers that I know use programs, and I think they must be wonderful, but this works for me. It's worked for me so far. <laughs> so I'm going to continue using it. That is a bit of a different approach, but I like it. And, and like you, I mean, I love hearing about how different writers do, you know, they just do different things, and, and it comes out in, you know, just different ways. What Wow, wow. That, that's and, and then one of, and one of the uh, aspects of it as well is I'm, I was looking into trying to find resonance within the novel so yeah. that I'm looking for different layers and that you'd have a story level and then you'd have a sort of a, 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 a meaning level and then you have a moral level and you have a biblical level. Like I try to wedge those things in and some aspects of it, some streams of it, I, would, I took out and then rearranged. I wrote it all at once, and then I went, no, no, this doesn't work. It's too much past. Let's shift it around. Mm -hmm. And also for this, I, uh, when I uh, decided that the house, the mansion that I set in Pembina County, North Dakota, when I decided on that, I thought, oh, this is good. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go and take, her on a, take them on a tour. And so I tried to have my time get my time schedule follow that same sort of uh, architecture where we went started on the outside just like we do when we do bible study mm -hmm. we start outside we read the first level and then we look down for the meaning and maybe we'll do some word studies until we get to the real heart, the oh real heart. <laughs> yes like i said it's it's complex and layered but beautiful and it's not preachy i i do want to make that clear i mean there is this of course, like you said, this this moral and theological note throughout the whole story, but it's it's never preachy. You just see these women on their own separate journeys almost and can contrast them because Sybil is looking for meaning in all kinds of strange places. And then you have Libby, who actually is the protagonist, really just searching for home and and it's, a, it's an amazing search. I want to be so careful not to give anything away, but, but I am going to stop here and say that Deb has a bachelor's in communications. She has a master of arts degree in theology, and she lives in Canada. I, I think I kind of missed that. Um, right across the border of Montana, so North Dakota, is, she's familiar with that area, and that's where she has set this story. And in the Twin Cities, the, the characters start out there. Um, one of the things that you talk about a lot, and I don't cook, but I was on Deb's launch team and there were all these things about soup and it's like, oh my gosh, soup, but soup plays such an important role in this book. And I was absolutely blown away that there's a philosophy of soup. <laughs> I mean, and my sister cooks, so she, she, she loves to do soups and, you know, put things together. So I sort of like, you know, okay, okay. Do you, you must cook. I mean, you, you do, right? I do cook. Uh, well, I'm going to tell you, when you say you were surprised that there was a philosophy of, philosophy of soup, I have no idea whether somebody <laughs> else would call it a philosophy. I developed a philosophy of soup through okay. <laughs> through, through one of the characters, um, um, a minor character in the book, and I had so much fun with him. Well, so I'll just say the minor character was Chef Virgil. Yeah. And Chef Virgil is British, and that's really tongue-in-cheek, because I have to say, although I do have some British friends, British culinary <laughs> arts are not, the British are not known for good cooking. <laughs> well, when I, if I've gone to England, I just eat lots of uh, Plowman's Lunch, 
but which is called or fish and chips and that you can't get any better than that <laughs> but no um but here we have a you know here we have a a, a character that likes soups. yes i grew up uh i grew up on soups and ethnic cooking the ethnic cooking of my family so my family background is Mennonite oh, but okay. this is the Mennonite that, that you would know in various parts uh -huh. of the United States and Mexico and Canada there's a difference in in Mennonite uh, in Mennonite lifestyle and so on it's not the old colony it's not the old style but very integrated but very faithful and so I grew up with all of the fabulous Mennonite food now my people my forebears came through Russia so they were in Europe they wow. went through Russia now the Ukraine because those wars changed and then when Russian nationalism started rising then I then they ended up in Canada in fact it was my great great grandfather who was one of the original 12 yes 12 came to spy out Manitoba. Really? <laughs> came How over. Yeah, they came over and they 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 were checking out the land and talking to see because Catherine the Great uh -huh. had 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 given them land grants in in Russia, and they came the same way to get land grants in southern Manitoba, which is a really rich farming area, and so um, they picked up some of the culinary tastes. That group of Mennonites, and there were lots and lots of us, lots of us, uh, picked up the Russian, some of the Russian and Ukrainian. So that's uh, like uh, my two of the recipes that I get. Uh, well, the, one of the recipes that I give is a very typical Mennonite recipe. So lots of dill and smoked meat, smoked ham or sausage, and and uh, and uh, fresh fresh veggies, and very just lots of butter and cream, you know it's it's delicious i have a hang so cool. but i also just love to make soups i just love that but i cook as well so i grew up with that and then when i was 20 i married a saskatchewan now some of your listeners don't know where saskatchewan is but <laughs> no, <it's> like <laughs> that's what, so we start where i am so we start out, out on the west coast we've got british columbia which is north of seattle mm -hmm. and then we've got uh, Alberta, which is north of Montana. Right. And then next one over is Saskatchewan, which is a prairie province, and it's north of... Um, well, it would uh, be north of Minnesota or Michigan, uh, even? Minnesota and, oh, no, I don't know my... my, my but anyway, the next one over is north of Minnesota. Or Wisconsin, maybe Wisconsin. It's, no. Uh, too far? Uh, anyway, what's, between, what's between, anyway. Um, so, <laughs> not, not about, so... So we just we just we're just heading heading. I started, I started yeah I started in the east or in the middle central Canada, uh, in Manitoba, and I lived there for twenty years, and then I moved in and moved to Saskatchewan to marry my cattle rancher at the end of a very long gravel road in uh, quite an isolated area, and learned how to be a ranch cook wife. Wow. My gosh, it was, I learned some wonderful cooking there from my mother-in-law. So I took the beauty and taste of my, my, and my mom's an artist and her cooking is art. Took that, added it to hearty beef. I make a gravy like fantastic. <laughs> because that's what ranch wives cook. I learned yeah. all about it. And then I, and then lived there for 20 years. And now we're in the next province over and I, I don't cook as much, but I do love to make soups and yes well i loved reading about it I, I mean because you know we live in such a spoiled age in a way because we can get ingredients you know just about anything we want any time of the year and yet in your book i mean it's very clear that these um even the people who came to the cooking seminar it's like they're getting into their roots and they're wanting to take what was native to their ethnic backgrounds to create their own soups and and i was just really fascinated by that about by that whole um, theme in your book of just you know going back to your own roots and what what food would your ancestors have eaten and and how you can make that really something special today and elevate it you know so yeah <laughs> I'll never make any soup but it was really fun no, to no, no, and I will tell you that the soups read better than they taste I mean soup is an art and honestly that's not a philosophy that's truth. <laughs> You have to taste it, and if it doesn't taste right, put something else in it. That's yeah. how you make a good soup. And so I have to say one thing, that while, of course, soup is an aspect of the answer to the question, the mystery in the novel, uh -huh. um, I will tell you that a few weeks ago, 
I went out foraging for a secret ingredient. <laughs> no, <and> no. <laughs> found that secret ingredient that because you've read to the end of the book, you'll know what one of those I secret ingredients is. And the other secret ingredient I had to find a supplier for, and it was very difficult. Really? Very difficult, but I found I found something, and so it was. And I made a pot of soup, and I put some in the freezer, <laughs> so I can eat some of that very particular mystery soup, that Bet's bowl, that Bet's bowl, on on occasion. I love it. Well, okay, you mentioned Babette, who is another character in the book, who is Libby's um, grandmother, and she's deceased at the beginning of the story, but plays still plays a very important role in, in the story and in the mystery. And as part of, oh, I don't know if I want to say this. <laughs> I know because I don't want to give anything away, but it reminded me of your emphasis on names. Like even, um, I am going to say this, the last name Walker. So, I mean, I just thought, oh, you know, she just kind of, you know, you just pull out a name. This character's last name is Walker. But no, it had significance. And it's like everything in the book has significance. <laughs> it's not just pulled out of thin air or just like I do searches for names. and Oh, that sounds like a good one. <laughs> I mean, it's just in, in the history, like, to Henrietta's and and variations of Henrietta being going from one generation to another. I mean, so so yeah, there's that. I could, I could talk about about this book all day, but here we go. I'm going to show the cover one more time. The Red Journal, beautifully beautifully written. A, again, a complex story, but well worth well worth the time and and just just beautiful. Let's may, may I, may I uh, say one thing? Sure. Of course, I may say one thing, and it's not going to be just you can't. <laughs> in like 10 minutes. No. Um, I really hoped that this book would be picked up by women who were looking for Christian fiction without, un, without putting the Christian fiction label on it because it doesn't quite fit the genre. It, you're right. Uh, you're absolutely uh, right. That they, would, that they would take it and think of somebody that they know that might be touched mm -hmm. by the underlying themes in it, because I'm hoping it will be a book that pre-Christian women will read. Yes, yeah, and, and definitely could see that as a, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it is, it's just, it's just beautiful. It's very intelligent and very, again, just so many themes to it. Um, but let's talk a, a little bit, um, while we have some time, about your first book, which, the Third Grace, which won the Grace Irwin Award. Now, I'm not familiar, but apparently in Canada, that's a very prestigious award. Yeah, I'll show the cover again. It, this is so beautiful. I mean, I just, I just love it, The Third Grace. Tell us, tell us a little bit about this and about the award that you received for it. The award is the largest Christian award given in Canada. Nice. But uh, we, don't have a, uh, we don't have such a cohesive... A Christian publishing industry in Canada. Uh, okay. Naturally, I would say there's almost no thing called a Christian publishing uh, 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 business in Canada. We have some Christian publishers, a couple of Christian publishers. Most of them are uh, self self publishers. That then mm -hmm. there's not even a publisher behind them. But we do have a couple of good ones, good solid ones. But as far as a whole industry, no, it's not really there. So we do have a couple of excellent across Canada organizations that represent and regional uh, organizations that represent writers who are Christian and the largest one that's uh, national puts up a substantial prize and uh, honoring Grace Irwin who is a Canadian writer so um, that was wonderful and it was a complete surprise <laughs> absolutely <laughs> a shock. I wasn't even gonna go because it to the award ceremony because it was so far away and somebody just very quietly said you should go and i can't tell you why and i went oh wow so i was totally totally floored there i was totally floored and everybody still that was a few years ago that was a uh, 2012 and and people will still start chuckling because of how, what an absolute fool i made of myself jumping up, so, up and down screaming and running down and jumping in the aisle. Oh, that was, it you're was loud. You are loud. <laughs> it was an honor. It was an incredible honor. Um, so this book is a story of a, again, a girl, this one lives in the country, mm -hmm. uh, country gone city. And she 
is looking for uh, her own meaning. This one actually deals with names as well because our little girl was a Mennonite girl called Mary Grace Clausen. And Mary Grace repudiated her background and wanted to get away from it because it was so repressive in her view. Mm -hmm. She wanted to be classy. She wanted to be artistic. She, she was a seamstress. She was so beautiful and she sold costumes. And so she ended up in, uh, in Denver uh, and sewing these costumes and on her way to Paris because she had been in love. With a French, French exchange student. Again, it's not a love, it's not a romance, but it is a kind of love story. Um, but she had been madly in love at 17 with this boy that had come to visit their farm. And, and so she goes to France on a work trip. And that's where a lot of the novel takes place. Oh, wow. And, and I can see that some of your background must have come through this because you've traveled extensively. You, mm. um, what is it, 30 countries and five continents? Yeah. You, you're a seamstress too. I read on your on your. I love to sew. I'm not a to sew. <laughs> I love to sew. I sew lots of that. I sew lots. So, lot. so it, it seems like you're able, because you're, you're such a talented and, and interesting person. I mean, you've done all these different things. You're able to pull from some of your life experiences to put into your stories, which there again, just adds a whole, you know, it, it it's a, it's a depth and, and a texture and it's, it's, it's really cool. Thanks. It's a pleasure to yeah. be able to relive, you know, to relive experiences that I have a terrible memory. So I forget my <laughs> pictures I have to read. Oh yeah, that's right. I did see that. And <laughs> just stir in a lot of imagination because who's going to challenge a fiction writer? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. My imagination. I can say that. <laughs> Can do anything. Oh my gosh. Well, real quick, because um, we're getting, running out of time, but real quick, I do want you to show your other book um, because, again, um, Deb is just very deep into scripture and pulling motifs. I love your website. I was on your website this morning and just some of the things in, in there just, oh, it's like, oh, I wish I had that. I wish I had your brain. <laughs> Just the, just the thoughts that you I, I am a bear of very little brain but i do have but i am very sensuous i do love uh my senses i love tasting and touching and smelling and so that comes that i can really pour into books but this is not a novel it's called roots and branches and let's read the whole yeah, I've got it right here. This is Roots and Branches, the symbol of the tree in the imagination of G.K. Chesterton. Right. Yeah. So this was actually the result of some graduate studies I did when I was at seminary. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it is a biographical and literary uh, analysis of a writer that many people know. So it, for people that don't know, if you've ever seen any of the Father Brown mm -hmm. uh, he, He's the create. He's the creator of those stories and, and that character. And so they, you know, they've of course made them much more palatable for. TV yeah. Better. But he's famous for that. But he was he lived in the British time at the same time as my novel character in this latest novel, The Red Journal. So he was about that same uh, late Victorian, early Edwardian period in Britain, and. Um, it was a fascinating for me to do this study, really enjoyed it. And particularly looking for the resonance, again, that word resonance, between scripture and literature. And that's what I was able to look at, is the, the balance between the two to see how a writer would pull scriptural principles out of the Bible and keep them sound, and at the same time, write fiction. And that's what my goal is, to send people back to the Bible. I want people with the Red Journal, for example, to read it and go, oh, oh, that sounds so familiar. Wait a minute. I know that. I know that. And then run back to scripture and see where it was that I picked up this idea and to see whether I was being truthful when I translated it into fiction. Yeah, because it's almost like um, the book of Esther in the Bible, and I, and you know, where the name of God is not mentioned, but God's fingerprints are all over that story. And you don't, really you know it's it's there again but you're not necessarily saying <laughs> here's the bible here's god but but it's all it's all right there and in so deep i do want to one more thing before we go this is the laird mansion and and you have the l and that's behind you and it's and it's really lovely just to have that drawing and was that a friend of yours that created that for you 
that was actually my sister. I live Your in a very, sister, okay. I'm a, yes, I'm from oh, a very creepy family. Sweet. Yes, yeah, she did that. And uh, uh, it's helpful because it does uh, yeah. uh, give a picture to, because the setting is quite important in the novel. It is, it is. And I know that's hard to see on here, but but I mean, anytime I see maps or diagrams like that, I'm like, oh, looks like I just, yeah, I just yeah, love that. That's great. Uh -huh. So yeah, that was that was pretty cool, and and to see again, you mentioned this early on about how there's just these echoes of things, even in the architecture and in the fencing and the lake and the well and the basin <laughs> base. I mean, it just all it, it's I don't know, I don't know how you ever ever ever. I just love it that you came up with all of that. Mm -hmm. and, and oh, so cool. thank you. Cool. Thank you. It was a pleasure to write. And isn't it a wonder, a wonderful thing being able to express ourselves in this way and, yeah. and, and that there are people that want to read it and then they read it and then the meaning goes to their heart. And uh -huh. then as a writer, you're actually having an influence on somebody's soul. And if it's only just the soul, if it's only and it's not the spiritual aspect of the person, but it's only the soul, that's the first level. Yeah. And how delightful it is that we're able to. Uh, interact with somebody's soul. Oh, I am just so thankful that God gave you this story because I truly believe they all come from Him. And um, it, yes, and that you you wrote it, and that I had the pleasure to read it because it's just it's just lovely, just lovely. One last question I ask everybody: um, When you're all done writing, you hit the end, you're all finished. What do you do to unwind? <laughs> wow, we <Probably> plan <laughs> another trip. Yeah. <laughs> that or like if immediately then probably a glass of wine and some dark chocolate that's what i i get that answer more than once <laughs> I can totally that. yeah, yeah. And something, something that tastes really wonderful mm. that, that i can say just ta-da it's <laughs> just that yeah. Yeah. but then there's always the next one <laughs> like, i know and it's being born as we speak yeah, <laughs> yeah. all right well Dad, thank you. You are just a delight. And thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. And for all those watching, thank you. We really appreciate your support and encouragement as well. Get the red journal. You won't be disappointed. <laughs> thank you. And thanks so much for having me. It's just been You're a delight welcome. getting to meet you a little bit. Uh, it was fun. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. See you next time on Novel yeah. is Unwind. <laughs> <laughs>